Jean-Pierre? Oui. Uh, so can we uh, switch? Um, well, of course Or we can switch. So we are a, bit, a little bit in advance, huh? Not really, actually. Okay. Uh, Christine, Christine, Christine is is there with us. Okay, uh, perfect. As, far as I can see, yes. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so, uh, so you can start. We can. Okay. Um, we can start um, uh, the introduction of Professor Bowman James, uh, saying first that uh, uh, he's a university distinguished professor of chemistry at the University of uh, uh, Kansas. She received both, both her undergraduate and PhD degrees in chemistry from Temple University in Philadelphia, uh, spending the last two years uh, her graduate degree at the Israel Institute of Technology, Technion, uh, in Haifa, where her advisor, Professor Tsvi Dori, had uh, relocated. After receiving her doctorate, he joined, he joined the research group of Professor uh, Darley H. Bush at um, Ohio State University as a postdoctoral associate, where she focused on the crystallography of transition metal macrocycle complexes. In 1975, she was appointed as an assistant professor in the chemistry department at the University of Kansas and rode through the ranks, becoming the first woman to chair the department uh, of chemistry uh, between 1995 and 2001. She was appointed um, then statewide uh, project director of what is now uh, the Kansas established program to stimulate competitive research. So this was in 2005. And uh, in 2007, she became a university distinguished uh, professor. In 2021, she became the second woman to, to win the American Chemical Society Award in, in Organic Chemistry, award that has been granted for her research in supramolecular ion coordination, uh, which is one of uh, her focuses uh, and which deals with the structural aspects of supramolecular chemistry from a coordination chemistry perspective, especially involving uh, anions of environmental and biological relevance. In, uh, it's interesting also to, to notice that in, 20, uh, in 1997, uh, she co-edited the first book on anion chemistry, supramolecular chemistry uh, of uh, anions that we also have here in our uh, library, and uh, that was uh, published by Wiley. So now, Professor uh, Bowman James, we are happy to uh, have you here and to listen to your conference. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, also, uh, I forgot putting too many dates in that bio sketch that I did send you. So, but that's okay. Uh, I've been around a while. And today, what I'd like to do is show you uh, some of the work that we have done, which is in three forays in supramolecular coordination, mostly in anion coordination. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference. And uh, I really appreciate that. And also, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the, today's speakers. I've heard them all. And uh, it's, they have all provided some very exciting and thought-provoking uh, scientific talks. And now I would like to uh, move on with my talk. My interest in supramolecular chemistry started at, um, at the first sabbatical leave I had with Jean-Marie Lane in Strasbourg. And I again put the date in with my late husband, Matt. And here you see one of the pictures taken there. And 
There we worked on polyammonium macrocycles as biomimics for phosphoryl transfer enzymes. The simple macrocycle could catalyze the hydrolysis of ATP. And my role in this as a trained inorganic coordination chemist was to add metal ions to see if we could enhance the catalysis. We've expanded quite a bit from the simple macrocycle we worked on in Jean-Marie Lane's lab. And today I'm going to talk about these macrocycles and uh, polycycles. And first starting with the more complex, the cryptand and the tetrahedron, and then moving on towards the monocycles in the second half of my talk. Our key to these synthetic uh, applications and, uh, is the fact that we use very simple building blocks. Being that I'm an inorganic chemist by background, we like something that's very simple. So the foray that we're, we're going to take today starts with simple anions to better understand structural aspects of supramolecular sequestration. So this is some earlier work a number of years ago, and I'm just going to show two examples of fluoride ion. Then we'll move to more complex polyanions, which is very recent work, and that'll be the most part of this talk, to better understand supramolecular interactions in polytopic anions with multiple binding sites. The example I'm going to use are the inositol hexaphosphates. And finally, in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about our latest project, our goal to better understand the supramolecular interactions of solvation in aqueous solutions. And I'll use, continue to use the inositol hexaphosphates, um, metal ion salts, and host gas complexes to illustrate our newest project. So starting with 4A1, simple anions, um, Dr. sung -ok Kong was able to make this cryptand, this hexamida uh, bicycle, which beautifully encapsulated was a terrific size for fluoride ion. And in fact, uh, one of the first questions that people do tend to ask in uh, these talks is, well, yes, in the solid state, it does bind fluoride, but what happens in solution? And there, what happens in solution, we decide, found that, in fact, it stays intact in solution. And so here you have the NMR that shows, proves our case. Uh, here is the free base with the free fluoride ion, this F19 NMR, in DMSOD6. And when you add a one to two ligand to fluoride ratio with excess fluoride in solution, you see two signals. You see the signal of the free fluoride, but you also see this beautiful heptet um, farther afield. And this is indicative, in fact, what we found later on of the fluoride um, enhancing the deuterium exchange process in the somewhat wet DMSO, such that uh, you get deuterium exchange with the amide NH groups. When you add equal amounts of ligand and fluoride, your free fluoride signal disappears. So, um, but this exchange process was noted after a 10 day vacation, long weekend, very long weekend of Sung Oak, where you see the, the septet uh, replaced by a series of multiplets. Still, we have the septet, um, sextet, quintet, quartet, all the way down to a singlet. And this is what clued us into the deuterium exchange process that was going on in the cryptand. So a few years later, 
Dr. Chi Chong Wong came on the scene. He's currently at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing, a full professor, I might add. I'm very proud of him. And he was really interesting, interested in synthesizing polyhedra. And so he started out with a simple polyhedra of the tetrahedron, of course. Uh, and this was a beautiful but much larger molecule than our simple cryptan. And what we found is it also bound fluoride, but it was large enough to incorporate the salvation shell of the fluoride within the cavity. So once again, we were very excited. We wanted to see if this was intact in solution. And this time we were disappointed. Uh, here is the tetrahedron, the beautiful single NH signal indicative of the very symmetrical structure. But in the presence of our complex, we, this was replaced by four signals of equal intensity, indicating that six signals were farther downfield, six NH groups were farther downfield, and six NH groups were farther upfield towards the original amide NH signal. So this showed us that the macrocycle, the cryptan, or tetrahedron had changed shape such that the um, only six now of the NH amide signals, amides were uh, interacting with directly with the fluoride. So we have now been able to actually tell which of these are interacting by other um, NMR experiments, but I have no time to go over that today because we are the last and I don't want to keep us too long. And so, but if you're interested, you can read this Jack's paper that was published in 2013. To progress to our second foray is phosphorus. And we are very excited about this. This is a very recent pro project of ours within the last five years. And when we were writing an NSF proposal in 2016, we found this um, NSF workshop that looked at the closing the human phosphorus cycle and the importance of the phosphorus in the global welfare of uh, life in general. And so the issue is, however, that there is a rapid depletion of available phosphorus resources, as most of us uh, realize. It turns out that much of the world's economically useful phosphorus comes from inorganic phosphate rock, and 80% of the world's reserves of the phosphate rock are located in politically unstable regions. Now, the importance of this, of course, is that nearly 90% of phosphorus is involved in the global food supply chain and mostly in fertilizers. Of course, this then uh, fuels the critically important role phosphorus plays in life processes. So we were actually looking around for some other sources of um, phosphate and phosphorus, and we came across <clears throat> the organic phosphates, which are highly prevalent in soils, it's much to our uh, surprise. Organic phosphates make up 50 to 80% of the phosphorus in soils. <clears throat> 20 to 50% are from this really incredibly gorgeous organic molecule. Um, known as the inositol hexaphosphates. Now, this comes in nine stereoisomers. And uh, basically, you have six phosphates hanging out from an inositol framework. <clears throat> if you actually analyze this for the percentage of fight phosphor phosphorus, you find that it has 28% phosphorus, huge amount, almost a third. 
phosphorus. Furthermore, for an anion chemist, this is a gorgeous molecule because it has valencies ranging from minus one to minus 12. If all of the um, hydrogens or if all of the oxygens are deprotonated. So phytate is found in eukaryotic species, plant seeds, grains, nuts, peas. We eat this thing every day. And its roles are in metabolic processes, many phosphorus storage and release, signal transduction, cell regulation, many that are still unknown and many more that are known. It's also known as an anti-nutrient because it soaks up uh, metal ions. Primarily, very many nutrients are divalent metal ions like calcium, zinc, iron, copper. And of course, it forms insoluble salts with all these charges. This is just a picture taken from the cover of the European Journal of Inorganic Chemistry, our first paper about phytate, the potassium phytate structure. Uh, and here are some of the more common sources of phytate that we uh, ingest frequently. So one of the things we first wanted to do was study the chemistry of this uh, new molecule for us, new anion. And it turns out that there is a strong pH dependence, of course, on the protonation. And at low pH, the myo-inositol hexaphosphate, the most prevalent of the stereoisomers, which is called phytate, has a one axial, five equatorial position of the phosphates. At high pH, it shifts to the five ax axial, one equatorial phosphate positions. And this is a, a called the uh, confirm conformation flip. And in fact, it's very sudden. And we did a pH titration to show people. Uh, actually, it's been studied very, very well by NMR by many researchers over the years. But what you see here is right around when you get between nine and 10, the signals due to the low pH conformer uh, broaden and start to shift. And here you have the signals for the high pH 5A1E conformer. This is a very sharp and abrupt change, as you can see by the function, this sort of uh, graph showing the pH is a function of chemical shift, or the chemical shift is a function of pH, uh, where it's right between 9 and 10. Now, I've also included down here another of the stereoisomers, the silo IP6, which is a much more symmetrical beast uh, with a six equatorial, six axial uh, conformations. And this in particular is another one that we've started to study. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So what is the problem here? The problem is a structural problem. There are a limited number of crystal structures of phytate salts. When we first started this project, there was only one crystal structure, and that was the dodica sodium crystal structure of phytate. Uh, phytate has minus 12 charge in this. There are 38 waters, and I've I've highlighted waters throughout the proposal to show um, how important water is in the interactions in these crystals even. By the time we were starting our project, another crystal structure appeared in the zinc complex of phytate, where here the phytate is also highly charged, minus 10. Then it, there were also some examples of supramolecular and transition metal complex structures by Carlos Kremer and Antonio Bianchi. Antonio is a long-term collaborator of ours. And for example, in simple supramolecular chelates like terpiridine, which can become protonated, 
or the copper terpiridine complex, which can bind via copper ions. Uh, these can also be crystallized much more readily, evidently, than the metal ion salts. And so they have a number of papers, uh, but the most recently, the Coordination Chem Review in 2020 is an excellent source uh, if you become interested in phytate. Well, since um, these first two structures, and as a result of our NSF funding, we have been able to get three more crystal structures of metal ion salts of the inositol hexaphosphates. The first we got, I showed earlier, the tripotassium salt where phytate is minus three. And these crystals were isolated by Molly Reinmuth, an, an undergraduate in our group. It actually only has two water molecules per phytate. And the reason being that Molly went home on Christmas vacation and let her sample run almost dry. And, uh, but we were very happy anyway to get the crystal structure. More recently, Dr. Sandeep Carr, a postdoc in my group, was able to isolate the first crystal structures of the silo salt. And this is the sodium-8 complex where the silo IP6 is 8 minus, and the sodium-12, the silo stereoisomer is 12 minus. And here you see the huge numbers of waters that are involved in the structure. And you can see that even just single molecules. I've only shown here the metal ions that are directly interacting with the phytate or the silo uh, phosphorus, uh, phosphates. So now I'd like to show some of the things we found with our supermolecular macrocyclic chemistry with phytate and the silo stereoisomer. And that'll be these more simple monocyclic systems, starting with our larger 36 membered ring system. We were able to crystallize, that is, uh, Shubo, Dr. Shubame Pramanik, who's another postdoc in my group, this uh, 36 membered ring macrocycle, which we'll call L1, we also call it the 3 plus 3. And here you see a beautiful sandwich complex with the phytate between the two sandwiching macrocycles. There, is only, there are only two direct phosphate macrocycle uh, hydrogen bonds. Uh, with, uh, this is the axial phosphate with two of the amides. And the one directly across the ring, the P5, with two of the other amide uh, NH groups. This is undoubtedly a result of the ungainliness of this 1A5, uh, the 1A5E uh, conformation. And here you see space filling. So I show you this crystal. It's not a beauty. Uh, it's much more beautiful in person. But uh, Next, I want to tell you about another crystal we got in that same batch of crystals. And here is a much more beautiful crystal. Uh, it's a rhombohedron, more or less. And what we observed, what we found when we did the crystal structure, that it was not a crystal structure of phytate, but was instead a crystal structure of a minor contaminating stereoisomer of the reagent, the silo stereoisomer, which was only present, at least according to integration, at about 3% concentration. This is a much more beautiful crystal structure for those of us who are crystallographers. And every single one of the phosphates binds by a chelation to the um, macrocyclic ligand. 
The ligand also likes to bind the two acetonitriles in the pyridine pocket above and below the macrocycle. So we were very excited about our initial discovery and have since now a number of other macrocycles, the smaller 24-membered ring macrocycles, which show different types of structures, mostly sandwich-like or wall-like between the macrocycle and the phytate um, guest. We did actually go back to one of our polyammonium macrocycles, this L4, um, which is hexaprotonated in the crystal structure. And here you see a different type of binding. You see uh, an LA, LA uh, sort of ladder-like binding. So, we were very excited. We've looked now at the quaternized without hydrogen bonds, with hydrogen bonds, and with lots of hydrogen bonds, and are still looking to some other um, macrocycles and hoping to get some more transition metal complexes. But this leads to the foray number three. Uh, supermolecular chemistry of water. This is very new for us. And it just came about because of the phytate project, where these crystal structures always have huge gobs of water. So here is a packing diagram, or sort of a packing of the relationship uh, between the different phytate sandwich complexes. This is, in fact, the Silo sandwich complex, which is prettier, so I use that. But you see this huge void between the macrocycles. So basically, the macrocycles shield the guest from its neighboring sandwiches um, because it just covers it. And the, the water acts as a buffer layer, sort of encircling each of these sandwiches. And so here you see, I put the water back in and I colored it aqua, my perception of what water looks like color-wise. And you can see they're all around the sandwiches around in the, these voids. <clears throat> so have we seen others of, like this? Yes, we have. The quaternized macrocycle forms a similar type of water in the system. Um, and we're now starting to investigate the roles that water plays in the actual host guest structure formation. And here is the uh, polyammonium macrocycle, which had 15 waters. You can see the difference here. And here we have. Uh, the waters are all around both the phytate or the phytate, yes, and the macrocycle. The silo salt water complexes uh, are just that. It's no longer just water in these voids between the uh, anions since it's not host guest chemistry anymore. These are the sodium structures that I showed you a little earlier. And here is the 6E structure with its waters surrounding the silo anion. And what you'll see here is, uh, well, I don't have two different kinds of cations. Um, the turquoise spheres are actually those sodiums that are directly bound somehow to the <coughs> silo anion. And this is a side view. The overhead view is very beautiful and you can see the beautiful organization of the salt structure around the silo anion. And for the 6A anion, you here <coughs> now have 12 sodium ions and you can see they're much more uh, congested 
around the silo anion. But interestingly enough, you do not have many direct interactions. In fact, we only have two strong interactions at the axial sort of coordinating holding all three of these axial phosphates in position, uh, both the upper and the lower ones. So there's only two really in this that have direct uh, interaction of the metal ion. There is another uh, crystallographically independent silo anion in the crystal structure, which only has another weak interaction of a sodium right down here, not too far from one of these axial uh, phosphates. And so here you can see the, the packing diagrams, the side view of the 6E packing, and the overhead view of the 6E packing, where you can see the nice network, nice salt water network uh, between the silo anions. So we're really excited about this new project and we're hoping to attract some theoretical chemists who would be interested, interested in modeling and doing some theoretical calculations on some of these uh, solvent layers and the water in waters in these complexes. So I think I'm doing pretty good on time. And so therefore, uh, but I have reached my summary. And so what I've done is pretty much shown some of our work for the last 20 years or so in small ions, uh, can't get much smaller than fluoride ion, and uh, monatomic fluoride to polytopic inositol hexaphosphates, and then to second sphere coordination with surrounding salt water and water layers. And so we're really excited about this project. There's lots to do, lots of room for others to join. If you would like to uh, look at a really interesting anion. And with that, I would like to give my acknowledgments. <clears throat> These are in chronological order of students. So the students who are currently working on this project are Sam Brunslick and Esther Holt. And so here's Esther in the picture. Here's Sam. This is my current group. The undergraduates are uh, Molly, uh, Kara Motley, but also Molly Reinmuth was the one who crystallized, did the first crystal structure. She was an undergraduate. I was very proud of her, am very proud of her. Uh, my collaborators, Victor Day, long-term collaborator, here he is. And also very long, Enrique Garcia Espana, Antonio Bianchi, uh, Bruce Moyer, Jonathan Sessler, and a newer collaborator, <clears throat> Carlos Kremer in Uruguay, who's also working in phytate chemistry. Also, I have to thank my postdoctoral researchers. I talked about Chi Chang and Sung Oak, Shuba Mei and Sandeep. My funding, mostly the early part was DOE and uh, recently, more recently, the National Science Foundation for all of this beautiful phytate, well, I think it's beautiful, phytate work. And I'd like to thank the conference organizers again for this wonderful, wonderful conference. And last but not least, I would like to dedicate this talk to the memory of Francois Dieter, a very good friend of mine. And uh, he gave me lots of support for this fight take project. He was very excited about it. So with that said, I will take questions or if everyone wants to scatter, that's okay too. <laughs>